engineering founding father of Hack in the Box captured the flag. Uh, he's been in the computer security industry for the past five years, previously a system architect at Scan Associates. Having been involved with the organization of Hack in the Box security conference for the last three years, he ran, he ran the popular Capture the Flag hacking competition. And in the past five years in the industry, he has been involved in various aspects of computer security, including penetration testing, software product development, training, network defense, system administration, and as well as being a freelance consultant. He currently runs a startup company that develops vulnerability and patch management software. Uh, his fellow presenter today, who will make his way on stage shortly. <laughs> uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you for coming uh, to uh, HITB uh, 2009, and thanks for uh, attending this uh, talk. Uh, initially, the idea for this talk was supposed to be a lab sessions where we will walk through uh, analyzing uh, packet captures and extracting evidence for network-based forensics. But unfortunately, the uh, the arrangement has been changed. So instead of a two-hour hands-on lab sessions where you will, you know, be able to participate as well, but so it's been turning to a, a what do you call it, a, a presentation. So, uh, without uh, wasting more time, let me begin. Um, anybody here performs network forensics or forensics in general? Raise your hands. No? One? Two? One? Two? Okay. So, what is network forensics? Uh, there are a few definitions of network forensics. The first one is on the screen. So, it's basically uh, the use of scientifically proven techniques to collect, fuse, and uh, identify, examine, correlate, uh, analyze, and document digital evidence from various sources. Okay? Uh, this is the uh, definition from uh, Gary Palmer. And according to security expert Marcus Renum, uh, network forensics is basically the capture, recording, and analysis of network events in order to discover the nature of security attacks or problem incidents. And according to Simpson Kaufingel, uh, there are two types of uh, network forensic systems, uh, catch it as you can, uh, in which all packets traversing through the network are stored and analyzed later. Or you have something that we are all quite familiar with, which is IDS model, stop, look, and listen, where every packet is inspected for uh, malicious uh, content. <coughs> and uh, basically, no forensics is about monitoring, determining if there's, there's any anomalies, and uh, determining the nature of attacks, if any. So, you can think of it in a scientific approach, you know, based on all these terms, or you can think of it as uh, as uh, as uh, uh, analyzing uh, recording, CCTV recording, for example. So in your house, you probably have a CCTV, and uh, you capture whatever that's going on. You know, for example, in the office, you know, people walking in and out, blah, blah, blah. And some of these activities, people walking in and out of the office, uh, carrying stuff, uh, moving things around, are legitimate activities. And network forensic comes when there's an indication of malicious activities. But it may not be malicious. It could be, a, uh, it could be uh, attributed to uh, a customer complaint. And you know, customer calls up to you and say, hey, you know, uh, I was trying to pay for my, uh, you know, I was trying to, to buy, a, buy a laptop from your company. And I found out that somebody else has been using my credit card number. Okay, so it doesn't mean that you you perform network forensics for you know purely for uh, intrusion or attacks. So so what happens now is in the real world, the investigator, the police or the guards, they will take a look at the CCTV and try to figure out what's happened. You know, so they look at the frames, look at the audio, they look at the video. They're trying to identify who's the culprit, who comes in and out, and perform evidence from there, uh, perform their uh, investigation from there. 
So in network forensics, however, you know, instead of looking at uh, video recordings, you're looking at uh, packets. So some of the tasks involved might be reassembling packets, uh, extracting traffic, traffic contents, uh, examining network flows, inspecting packet headers, and so on. Right? So when you perform network forensics, or any forensics for that matter, especially for network forensics, you'll be asking you know, when a particular IP has successfully compromised the system. So you want to confirm that. You want to determine the duration of a HTTP session. How long is the session? Is it a long session? Is it a short session? If it's a long session, probably it's a file upload. You know, uh, a webmail activities, uploading files, sending files through webmail. If it's a long download session, it could be a you know download sessions. A which network protocol is using attacks? TCP, UDP, ICMP, blah blah blah. What's the, my, uh, what's the main attribute of successful data transfer in TCP, for example? So when you establish that, okay, this guy is transferring data to a external server or whatever, so how do you confirm it? What's the attribute? Um, what's the main attribute of successful file download, upload in FTP connections? Uh, successful download, upload, or even delete, file delete in the SMB, in network shares, in Windows shares, for example. Um, and so on, and so on. Okay, so these are the questions that you want to answer. So, now, why network forensics? Okay, there's file-based forensics, there's host-based forensics, there's memory forensics. Why network forensics? Because it's temper resistance, especially if you deploy it in a bridge, if you're tapping the network, in a tap or a bridge mode. So this evidence will not be uh, polluted or will not be uh, tempered with by the attacker. Unless, unless of course, you know, the attacker managed to get a hold of your uh, monitoring infrastructure. Uh, where else, if you look at uh, host-based forensics, log files can be deleted, you know, uh, files can be deleted, entries, timestamp can be changed. Where else, for network, it's temper resistant. Uh, there's no performance impact on the endpoint. You're sniffing the network, you're monitoring the network, and that's it. Uh, no management impact on platform. You're not running uh, intensive programs or application or monitoring software on hosts or servers. Works across all operating systems because you're dealing only with PCAP data or network flow. Um, and you might be able to derive information that host base might not provide. Say, for example, a file has been deleted from a disk, right? Or has been uh, so uh, on a network share. So basically what happens is for a Samba share, when you delete a file, the Samba protocol will send a, will, will contain uh, fl uh, flags that indicate successful deletion. So you can confirm that that in the, you can look for that particular attribute in the network capture and you can confirm yes, there's a successful file deletion, there's a successful file copying, blah, blah, blah. So, network forensics, you all know this, used for evidence recovery, same as host base, same as mobile forensic, memory forensics. Uh, here's an example that I've, uh, that I've shown earlier, that I've talked about earlier. So, basically, it gives you a lot of information uh, that host-based forensic might not give, and it will also complement uh, the host-based uh, forensic investigator. Right, let's move on. So the process is quite simple. You capture, you record, and then you analyze. Right. So the goal is to discover nature of intrusions and to complement host-based forensics. Now, uh, let's talk about how Maybe some MNCs or some companies do four and six. Okay, so what they do, they get an IDS alert message. Okay, so based on the alert, you go on and examine the event. Okay, what's the event? You know, backdoor connection, uh, TCP and map scans, uh, IE seven memory corruption, uh, attack attempts, uh, and then 
the analyst will perform packet examination. So look at the protocol header, for example. And based on the event, determine, OK, is this, uh, does this confirm with the earlier uh, indication that we get from the IDS? All right. um, followed by escalating the event to uh, the appropriate channel, security response or incident response, and so on. However, uh, what, we've, what we've thought in uh, the last two, two, two days of training, uh, we use a different approach, approach to network forensic analysis. Okay? So your alert can come from other sources. Right? Uh, customer complaints, for example. They cannot assess uh, server outage, uh, service disruptions. Right? So it's not necessarily security incidents. So if the uh, network monitoring guys come to you and say, look, you know, our, our network is... Uh, you know, having uh, congestion at the moment, you know, we can't go out to the internet, blah, blah, blah. So that could be part of your forensic investigation uh, mm -hmm. as well. And you determine the event's occurrence. Again, uh, going back to the CC, CCTV recording example. So customers say, you know, my, I think, uh, my, 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 my purse or my bag or my notebook was stolen at this hour. So you go back into time and try to determine when the event occurred. And you analyze the sessions. So we're going we're gonna to explain more about what a session is in the next few slides, uh, followed by examining the packets that you get, provided that you have monitoring uh, infrastructure, and then escalate the event. And another thing that uh, network forensic analysts have to, be, uh, have to keep in mind is that uh, when you as sometimes you need to uh, examine the traffic payload as well because it provides uh, a lot of information uh, you know, on malicious traffic. So the purpose, I think this, uh, so for the new technique is to uncover malicious activities and then reconstructing of session data, uh, reconstructing past network events, right? So when you, basically network events already happened in the past. So you need to reconstruct, tell a story from it. Uh, extract evidence. Uh, if you need to extract uh, files from the packet capture. So that's the evidence. Uh, and if the traffic is encrypted or hidden, then that's part of the process. So here's a big picture. So there's the security analyst here uh, on, the, uh, on the left. Um, the main box, the green box, basically explains all these cards to process, not in order. So from the top, you have indications like IDS alerts or customer complaints, system or service outage. And then, you know, you get your evidence, the blue box. It could be a lot of files. It could be IDS alert files. And uh, for, for this particular presentation, is we focus more on uh, packet capture. And you have the analyst, you know, he, he as an analyst for, for network forensics, you need to have a few skill sets, which is in the yellow box. And then he goes on, you know, looking at evidence and uh, trying to discover the source of that particular incident. All right. So that's the introduction. Now you have a general idea of what uh, network forensic is. So, uh, you know. So what do I use? Right. So we always talk about tools. Right. Everybody loves tools. So there's a lot of uh, tools out there. And before we go talking about tools, uh, one thing they have to know, keep in mind, is that if you want to choose a specific tool for a specific uh, task, okay, especially for network forensics, you have to ensure that this particular tool ensures data integrity. Okay. It will not. Pollute your 
uh, it, it will not pollute your uh, evidence. It will not mess around with your uh, evidence. It does not interpret. You know, it, it, it interprets the evidence properly. Okay, uh, you want to have. I mean, talking about network. You want to have and you want to use high quality protocol detectors. For example, for example, Wireshark. Uh, and you want to use data, or uh, you want to use tools that can auto automatically reconstruct session data. So you want to, you, you know, you don't want to do this uh, manually. Uh, something that offers the next point. A uh, tool that can offer high-level information about network events, things like what's the top protocols, what are the distribution of packet size, uh, who are the top talkers, top communication, uh, what is the most widely used protocols, and you also want to have tools that can that are able to extract files or useful content from packet capture. So if you're dealing with uh, payload data, if you're looking at, if, if you want to analyze uh, the payload, you want to extract evidence from the payload, so you're going to have tools that can do this as well. Um, you need a tool that can replace sessions, like Telnet, FTP, RLC, or IM messages, chat messages. And of course, we emphasize on free and open source tools. And again, usage of tools depends on your needs. So here are some of the open source toolkit. Uh, we, we would like to show you how to use it, but uh, the two hour lab session has been reduced to one hour. So I'm just going to go through them and so that you have an idea of uh, the available network forensic tools out there. Uh, Explico is a network protocol analyzer. Uh, it's not a network protocol analyzer, but open source network forensic tools, right? So it offers uh, port independent protocol identification. What does it mean is that if you're running services on a non standard port, okay, for example, I'm running SSH on port 80, so PIPI or PP check uh, is able to detect that particular service. Oh, yeah, it's SSH running on port 80. Uh, it has solid TCP reassembler re to extract application data, uh, content from picket files, uh, supports logging to database, MySQL, SQLite, uh, geolocation mapping, and many more. Uh, here's are some commands. You can run it in real time. Uh, and basically, you can run it in real time and listen on the network interface, or you can run it uh, offline. You can read a packet capture file, uh, or you can specify a directory uh, with, you know, full of uh, packet capture and decode it, and, uh, and so on. So here's an example. It's a screen. Okay, screenshot. Uh, so you can see that. Uh, you can load new packet file. Uh, it has uh, columns. It has uh, sections for HTTP, MMS, FTP traffic, email, uh, and so on. Let's see a few more slides. Here is an example of emails <coughs> extracted from packet capture. This is this this was extracted by Explico. Uh, and the good thing is, like uh, this user interface, you can click and you can view the entire email in its entirety. Uh, you can view images. So again, you know, you need a tool that able to extract image, able to extract files, and so on. Uh, another interesting tool uh, is uh, PY Flag. So PY flag is unique. Well, it will not really unique. It's, it's, it's interesting because it offers correlation with log source and file system memory forensics. So it's used for both host-based forensics, file system forensics, memory forensics, and also 
network forensics. And uh, it provides a high level analysis information. Uh, it has a protocol scanner to scan against PCAT file to reconstruct streams for different network protocols. And one feature that is interesting for a network analyst is the capability to index PCAP, PCAP data. So indexing means that, OK, you have, I mean, if you're looking at files, PCAP files the size of 10 meg, 100 meg, it's, you can do it manually. You can use uh, TC bar, uh, TCP dump filter to filter out the uh, packets of interest, but if you're looking about gigabits of gigabit of gigabyte of data, uh, you're looking at huge packet uh, packet data. So filtering them for the specific IP address, source or destination IP address or port, for example, will be very it will, it will, it will take forever. So the, the however with indexing capability, you can search for a particular packet of interest very quickly. Uh, how they do it, you got to read the economic paper on that. It's quite, uh, uh, quite technical. Interesting, actually. Right. Uh, here's an example of a, of a PY flag screenshot. Okay. This is... Uh, this is uh, the the it's it's a tree, a tree view, so you can see on the left is the source destination, and then further down, if you click, you can see the uh, stream, uh, and the decoded protocol pop, and you can see all the information, right? This is a Amazon chat session. Extracted by uh, POI flag. Uh, hi there, buddy. What's up, man? I'm getting a new plan ready. You know, let's take over the world. Let's, you know, do whatever that we want to do. Okay, so that's uh, POI flag. Uh, TCP attracts is a tool for extracting files from network traffic based on file signatures. So. In uh, in forensics, there's this there's this term that they they use, which is called data carving. Data carving. So when the forensic analyst, for host-based forensic analyst, tries to discover, recover deleted files on the file system, so they use a technique called data carving. Basically, what it means is like it's taking files based on the contents of the file, such as the headers, okay, and the uh, all, uh, and or all the footers. So if you do a hex dump on PDF file, for example, you will see percent PDF dash 1.4 or dash 1.5, the version of the PDF document and stuff like that. So this file carving basically makes use of that particular headers and try to extract the files. Okay, so you can write file signatures. Um, I don't have an example of file signatures here, but uh, if you go to uh, fileext.com, right, uh, this website uh, have uh, a lot of uh, information about uh, about files. Oh, I have it. Okay, so here's how you write uh, TCP extract signature. Um, the slides will be online, so don't have to. But basically, uh, i just explain a bit. Uh, the first two lines, you can see I'm doing a hex dump on a secret.pdf. And you can see the, the second one is super secret.pdf. So you see PDF, the common uh, headers will be PDF dash percent PDF dash 1.4.5. And another one is percent PDF dot 1.4.9. So if you want to detect all kinds of uh, files, so you need to look for this signature. Right. <clears throat> so TCP flow. Uh, you, the goal is to construct different TCP flow streams in separate files for analysis. Right. So if you have uh, different, uh, you know, if 
I mean, most TCP, most traffic will will consist of different sessions, uh, HTTP, uh, MSN, BitTorrent, blah blah blah, chat. So TCP flow basically to construct different TCP flow, and there, will they, it will be done in a separate files for analysis. <coughs> Uh, another tool that we'd like to use is uh, Chaos Reader. Uh, it can reconstruct uh, network sessions like FTP, RSC, uh, and replay the session. So you have a nice screen with okay, the attacker or the user to the internet to the server and then what he keys in. Okay? Uh, as nice uh, HTML report. So that's uh, Chaos Reader. I'm sure you all use Wireshark and heard of Wireshark. Even if you don't use it, you probably heard of it. Uh, Wireshark has powerful filtering capabilities. Uh, it's very flexible for analyzing session data and application protocols. Um, it can use, it can perform things like uh, follow TCP stream. So you can see the, uh, the, 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 the connection, the, you know, what is the communication between two endpoints. And the new version uh, of Wireshark supports UDP stream. So the difference between TCP and UDP is that TCP is, uh, is, a, is a session based protocol. Okay? So because it's a session based, pro based protocol, it's easier for you to follow the conversation, whereas UDP is stateless. Uh, the technique that Wireshark use is not look, it's not uh, to reconstruct the session. It's not by looking at the UDP headers, but rather going up into the the uh, network stack by looking at the application. So if I want to reconstruct a UDP session for DNS, I will look at the DNS protocol. So that's how they do it. <clears throat> so I think a few of you attended our training and we use uh, Network Miner. Uh, this is for Windows. Uh, Windows, again, it can reconstruct another session and it can um, recover files. Do you have a screenshot? Yeah, we have a screenshot. Okay, so this is a screenshot of Network Miner in action. Okay, you can filter, you can search uh, for... Uh, you can search on the, uh, at the application layer, for example, the payload of TCP and UDP packets. You can search the entire uh, packet data. You can, do, uh, you can search for a protocol that is not passed by network miner, and so on. Okay. So in the GUI, you see a few tabs. The list of hosts, the network frames, files that was uh, extracted, images that was extracted, credentials, usernames, or password if it's in clear text, uh, DNS queries, and so on. <coughs> Formos is another tool uh, for uh, extracting the uh, file. Formos works. Promos works for uh, host-based forensics as well as network packet. Okay, so this is an example of uh, extracting files from uh, Promos. Claim AV, uh, in when we when we extract evidence, when we extract files, unknown files, we need to run it against a uh, virus scanner, for example. So you can use Claim AV or you can use any other. Uh, antivirus uh, software out there. Okay, screenshot. Okay, interesting files there. New picture. Right, Stop like that. All right, so let's move on to the next one. Um, we're gonna talk about uh, the different kind of data that you can get from network traffic. Uh, the four common ones 
uh, we call them network-based evidence, uh, statistical data, session data, alert data, and then we're going to move on to uh, looking at uh, application data, right? So statistical data provides a high level or general overview of uh, network traffic over time, such as hours, days, weeks, months. Answer the question, okay, who are the top pair of destination IP and port? Uh, who are the top talkers in the network? How much NS queries are we receiving in a day? Who downloads the most data? And so on. It's used to form a wave line to look for deviations. Okay? So one thing that we always emphasize is that it's far easier for you to investigate an incident if you are familiar with the familiar. Okay? So rather than trying to look for, you know, Rather than spending your hours, your time uh, looking for like examining packets, uh, decoding protocol, it'll be, you'll be more productive if you know, uh, if you're familiar with that uh, particular protocol. In this case, it's, it's network. So if you know that, if, you're, if, if you are familiar with your network environment, for example, you know that you know, our SMTP traffic is always 30%. If it goes 40%, then it indicates something abnormal, right? So that's the, uh, that's the idea here. If you know, you know, if you are familiar with a HTTP connection, for example, if you're familiar with HTTP protocol, you will be able to detect, it'll be, it'll be easier for you to detect uh, covert channel hidden in HTTP protocol, right? So, I always, you know, try to familiar yourself with protocols, with your, uh, you know, with your network environment, okay? So that's the uh, statistical data. Um, it's usually used in a reactive manner, so that's, I think that's practically true for everyone. Uh, it's used for, you know, when, when something jumps, when your graph jumps, go haywire and then you start doing something on it. <coughs> the other data that you'd be interested to look at will be the network session. Okay, so, uh, so uh, or network flow. Now, network flow is set of traffic that is related to the same stream, okay? is equivalent to a call. You know, when you're making a call to someone, hello, how are you? Uh, let's go for a date, blah, blah, blah. Then you hang up, bye-bye. So that is one session, okay? Uh, so you have uh, a start time and last time and yeah, a few other information such as uh, duration, uh, how many bytes are transferred, uh, and so on the pod, okay? So think of it as, a, as one communication between, one complete uh, communication between two endpoints, right? So uh, the start time, basically, uh, usually the first packet seen in the flow, uh, some network tools, network flow tools have different definition of start time and stop time or end time, okay? Uh, they may use terms like last time or they may use terms like end time, but uh, we normally use uh, start and last time, okay? Uh, and the last time, again, uh, the last time may increase with the age of the flow and depends on the progression of the flow meter. So, if you're using a software uh, that analyzes flow, and reconstruct the session, the, the flow session automatically, you gotta know how it defines the, the last time. Uh, it probably have a configuration that says, you know, okay, the start time, the duration should be five minutes, right? Or 120 seconds. But 
So what happens is if you have a long session like HTTP download that takes about 30 minutes, instead of one flow, you're going to get like six, six flows. OK? So there's something to keep in mind. <coughs> um, going into semantics, uh, session and flow, session is conversion between two. OK, let me go back. So you have uh, one session, right? And then you have a flow. So in that particular session, you may have different flows. Now, these flows, again, is defined by your uh, network uh, flow analysis tools. So like what I've mentioned earlier, so that 30 minutes is one session. But inside that particular session, there are six flows. Okay? So that's the reason why is, you know, like I explained here, the start time and last time is delimited based on the configuration of the flow meter. Uh, and then we have things like unidirectional and bidirectional flow. Unidirectional will be single direction, bidirectional will be both direction. Okay. So in this example, the top box is uh, unidirectional. You see the direction from host A to host B, and the total bytes transfer is 50 bytes. The second one is will be host B to host A. Uh, host A uh, returns basically host B returns. Uh, total of 100 bytes to both host, host A. Uh, so, if you view the data in bi-directional, you will see the connection host A, host B, total bytes, 150 bytes. Source bytes will be 50, and the destination bytes will be 100. So, So here is uh, unidirectional is one direction at a time, bidirectional is both direction at a time. Okay? And uh, if you've heard of Argus, uh, which, is, uh, which is an open source tool for flow analysis, okay, it uses bidirectional model for flow generation. And uh, you can convert the bidirection to uniflow uh, output as well. And if you use uh, Cisco NetFlow version 5, it's unidirectional. So you need to convert it to bidirectional to have a big picture of the particular network session. Yeah, I'm going to finish this up, then I pass it to him, because I don't want to hog the microphone. <laughs> uh, so how do you perform uh, flow analysis? If you have time, we will show you the, uh, the examples later. Uh, so when you perform generic flow analysis, right, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's statistical and it's based on session. You don't look at, you don't look at the, uh, the, 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 the payload. Uh, there's no false positive or negative because you're looking at you know, connections, again. Uh, it's, doesn't you know it, it, you don't care about the content or, or the payload of the packet uh, if there is a covered channel in that particular session it, uh, it's you know there's no way for the there's no way to fool flow analysis by using covered channel a simple example a simple example would be looking at uh, ICMP flows right so normally ICMP flows, when the source, when source A pings, uh, sorry, when host A pings host B, send a ping, the packet is normally 60 bytes, okay, 40 bytes, uh, 20 bytes of headers, and another 40 bytes of uh, data. All right, so it's consistent. You will see if you filter the flow output and you look at ICMP, you will see a very consistent. The, the reply will be 60 bytes as well. Okay. Now, what happens if the attacker uses uh, ICMP covert, uh, ICMP tunneling? Okay. You will see a very, the size of the packet will vary. Okay. You will get small 
uh, source bytes and very large uh, destination bytes uh, return, return from the destination. So if you're an analyst and you look at this, you'll be like, hmm, how come you know, the, the size differs from each? You know, how come the size is not consistent? So this may indicate a covered channel through HTTP. Right? It's encryption neutral. Again, we're not looking at contents. Uh, and of course, it's used for anomaly detection, DDoS detection, and network reconnaissance. It is trap. Uh, here are some, some terms. I, uh, I'm not sure I want to go through each of these, but uh, you know you have the start in, uh, in you have the start time and end time, the length, total packets per flow. Uh, you know what's the, uh, the, the 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 summary of the data transfer, and you probably have the route info as well. Okay, these are the basic a uh, basic uh, some of the basic uh, metrics. If you're looking at IP. You're looking at source and destination IP, and maybe TTL. If you're looking at TCP, going further down, you look at uh, source and destination ports and TCP flags. So you can see the status of that particular flow, whether it's ongoing or whether it's completed, right? Based on the TCP flags. Uh, for UDP, you can look at the uh, source and destination ports, ICMP. You can look at type and code. Code. So. You can detect things like um, DOS attempt, worm activities, and port scanning in the flow. Why? Most of these types of activities will have high connection rate. So you will see a lot of flows, a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of flows. Um, the packet rate, for example, the connection rate, and the packet rate, you know, you have you can see a lot of packets from one source to another, uh, from one source to many, many sources. Okay? So, a sudden appearance of high packet rates linked to previous session with ADS alerts may indicate a full compromise. So, if there is a machine on your network that suddenly starts to generate a lot of outgoing traffic, then it could mean that the box has been compromised and now the worm is trying to infect or scan the entire machine uh, the machines on the network um, so network scanning right uh, slow and single flows for example one flow uh, to different ports or different hosts you can see large sum of small flows to and from a certain IP address, right? Uh, sync or TCP, uh, TCP sync to a few IP address, a few ports. And the characteristic would be things like you, s you will see uh, a lot of RSTs, return RSTs from resets from the host, uh, from, uh, from the destination because the port is it's not open, for example, or for TCP and SMB and port unreachable for UDP. So you can detect uh, all kinds of uh, <coughs> network activities from flow. Um, again, uh, worm, okay? Worms may scan uh, bagon space, okay? address space that are not used and should not be used, for example. Uh, payload may be downloaded from specific malicious sites. Uh, source address is usually spoof. And uh, each variant, so if you're looking at different variants of uh, malware, most of them have identical payload size. Okay? They target multiple hosts, but only a single port on each host. So this is true for uh, most of the worms. They may target one port or maybe two <laughs> ports. Okay. Now, cover channel. Um, I've explained uh, about this. Uh, the purpose of the cover channel is, you know, for the attacker to uh, to hide the tracks uh, and also to bypass uh, filtering or detection devices. 
if you uh, if your network is very very heavy, then it's very very difficult to track. Okay, uh, it's carried over well-known protocols, uh, and uh, there are long flows and there are short, short flows. For example, in S lookups in, in the cover channel, um, it goes through symmetric and asymmetric traffic. For example, HTTP, and you may notice inconsistent payloads. For example. Um, we cover channel is one of the way for the attacker to hide themselves, but there are other methods as well. Uh, for those that attended our class, we talk about connection scrambling, we talk about evasion, and so on, fragmentation, and so on. But this is one of the example. Okay, so pass it to you. Hello, hello. Wake up. I myself haven't wake up yet. So um, I'm going to continue where our spoon fork has stopped. So which is uh, alert data analysis. So basically, the alert data analysis, uh, we use the IDS to detect the attacks or decide whether the traffic is good or bad. So it looks for the signs of intrusions and generate alerts based on detection engine. So basically, uh, we like to cover Snort IDS and Bro IDS. So how many of you heard about Bro IDS? Uh, Snort? All right, so uh, apparently uh, Bro is not as uh, popular as Snort. <coughs> So when we look at uh, Snort IDS, Snort IDS is basically uh, utilizing signatures matching engine. Okay, it utilizes heavily on a signature matching engine, while Bro IDS utilizes its own uh, proxy scripts. So if you want to know more about Bro proxy scripts, you can actually search in a Bro website. For the Snort, it's a popular open source and network intrusion detection and prevention system. So it's commercialized appliance developed by Sourcefire. So um, currently it's 2.x, it's in a version 2.x, and it's going for 3.x, which is uh, having a scripting uh, support. They, uh, it's not 3.0, they are going to have a lower scripting support, which is uh, just like Bro. Bro by itself supports the scripting, but they use their own policy scripts. So normally, here's a command that you can run if you have the snort signature rules loaded. And it will generate the alert file. And sometimes the snort.log file, it depends on what you want. It can be a unified form file, or you can be a TCP dump file. So Bro IDS, on the other hand, is a real-time network analysis framework. So and can be used for pure network analysis. So it emphasizes on the application level semantics, which means that it doesn't really uh, do uh, per packet matching, which means that it doesn't look at, if you heard about ngrep, network grab, it actually do matching on per packet basis. But Bro doesn't do that. It will try to reassemble the traffic so that it will perform the matching. So it has no presumption of good and bad. Good or bad is uh, policy neutral, which means that it does not do signature matching, even though it has it has signature matching capacities, but they don't really emphasize on it. So we are not going to talk much about these two IDS. Uh, however, you can actually search the website. Okay, you search in the website that it contains a lot of information, especially it's not. So we are going uh, towards the uh, application protocol analysis. So in here, we are going to introduce uh, Things that you might want to look at, okay, things you might want to look at when performing the application protocol analysis. Because when doing a network forensics, all we want is actually the files or maybe something that is transferred over the network. So focus on application protocol specification and its properties. Understand why you use protocol deeply. Identify file transfer and extract useful information. So it it basically offers uh, deeper insight into attacks and confirm uh, hypothesis created during generic packet analysis. 
So it, it can confirm, for example, things like a successful FTP transactions, or maybe a, a, a touch, there's an attachment in the SMTP traffic. So it confirms successful DNS poisonings and so forth. So to a certain extent, it gauge the skills of the attackers. Like an attacker that uses evasion techniques may exhibit a level of expertise and sophistications. This also indicates a targeted attack as it shows that attacker is being cautious. So for example, here is the DNS uh, packet. So this is a uh, DNS uh, query. It's a TXT query. The type of it is a TXT. It's a text string query. So you can see here, uh, is, is we are using a Wireshark to open it. So <clears throat> if you are going to analyze a DNS traffic, OK, DNS traffic is interesting because uh, it allows you to perform various kinds of analysis. For example, DNS forensics allow you to determine someone's behavior, which most ISP likes to do, because they know where you are serving, website that you are serving based on the host name. So they know they can actually study your behavior. That's what Google is doing as well. So basically, if you, you, are, you want to analyze someone's behaviors, so what kind of packet suppose you lock? What kind of packet suppose you lock and try to co collect in order to study someone's behaviors? So DNS is one, but are you going to uh, collect a DNS query or are you going to collect DNS uh, query response? Anyone has idea? So if if you want to uh, make sure that the query is successful, that it has a response, so of course uh, we will look at the response, the query response. The interesting part about our DNS query is that the DNS response packet always contains the query. So if you want to study uh, DNS traffic, so if you just uh, go for the DNS response, that's enough. Okay, that's enough. So. Here are some of the examples to analyze a DNS using a TCP down T shark. So basically, it's like you can analyze the UDP traffic using a <coughs> using the Wireshark filters, uh, which is like dash r the capital capital r t -t TCP dot port uh, equal to fifty three or UDP dot port equal to fifty three. So to display the DNS traffic, and for DNS query traffic, you can search for the DNS the flag 0 times 0, 01 0, 0. So DNS the flags, that is a particular uh, Wireshark filters. So you may heard about BPF. Any anyone of you heard about BPF? Mercury packet filters? That when you use TCP dump, you are going to use it like uh, TCP dump dash R, then the packet file, then TCP or TCP uh, square packet 13 square uh, close square bracket equal to 2 or uh, UDP IP let's say you want to filter out the IP traffic you just type IP you want to filter out UDP you just type UDP so if we are going to analyze uh, protocol headers itself like for example uh, those lower layer protocol like TCP UDP IP wise so you can make use of BPF uh, unfortunately BPF is, uh, is considered O and uh, even though it's very useful but it doesn't allow you to actually dig into certain offset of application traffic, which means that if you want to look for the particular offset in HTTP traffic, you can really use BPF. So that's why we always uh, use this uh, interchangeably by using like, we are using BPF if we just want to look for, want to filter TCP, UDP, or IP, or ICMP, but otherwise, if we are going to filter the particular traffic, using uh, uh, for application protocol, we are using Wireshark filter. So this, and this one is a HTTP packet. HTTP contains a lot of uh, information. It contains a lot of information, especially on client requests and the server response. So <clears throat> to analyze the HTTP, usually uh, we like to look, look at uh, what, is con uh, what contains inside the HTTP traffic. For example, I can use uh, t -shark and then HTTP contains cookies to search for the cookies. Or I can use 
uh, there's QZ HTTPS uh, common state to actually look for to actually uh, shows the statistics of HTTP traffic. So here are the HTTP request methods like get, post, hit, put, delete, trace, options. So these are some of the examples of uh, HTTP request methods. So each uh, methods usually will tell you what this uh, HTTP traffic is about. So the response, response code itself also will tell you the information like if it's about 1xx one, one between 100 to 200 is uh, informational, so 200 is uh, successful, 3xx three, three is redirections, I, I think a lot of you may face uh, this, and 4xx is bad requests on a client side error, and 5xx is unsuccessful. So these are the response codes written by the HTTP servers for the HTTP request from the client. So common HTTP status code like 200 is OK, and then partial content 206, 301 move permanently, and so forth. So for full list of explanations, so you can read that. In uh, Wikipedia, they have a list of uh, HTTP status codes. So one of uh, interesting thing is that not all successful HTTP attack returns HTTP 200. Okay, for example, most of ca like in most cases of SQL injections, the return code is HTTP 500, HTTP 500, which may indicate a successful SQL injection attack. Okay, this because there's the response from the backend, not the web server itself. So, the header fields. These are some of the examples of HTTP header fields, like accept, accept character set, encoding, language, and content encoding. So a compromise server with cover channel may behave differently. If, if you look at the HTTP traffic, the cover channels that are using HTTP may have different kind of uh, properties. So like, there is a study about the HTTP headers itself. Okay, HTTP headers itself. The arrangements of uh, HTTP traffic like for example, user agent, host, cookies, and e-tag, right? It may be arranged differently. So maybe like sometimes it's user agent first, then host, but in particular traffic, you see host first, then a user agent. Based on different arrangements, so you can recognize different kind of traffic from different softwares. So this one is uh, the part that we always like to look at, which is the content type. So, for example, like the content type will tell you that what kind of files are going to transfer, like application slash zip, maybe MS Word, JPEG, TIFF, MPEG, QuickTime, Octet Stream, maybe a binary stream. So, by looking this uh, at this uh, particular HTTP property attribute, so you can actually recognize that what kind of files are actually transferred. So, interesting HTTP headers, user agents. If you heard about uh, emerging threats, uh, emerging threats uh, project that they are actually giving out all the snort rules for free, um, you, they always study on the user agents. They have all kinds of the snort rules about the user agent. Different user agent con is actually comes from different kind of malwares. So you can actually uh, try to download it and then learn about different kind of user agents. So the the interesting part is that the, in the, if you uh, follow the link from the WebSense, so they have uh, this uh, example of website that con conditionally serving up malicious content depending on the user agent string. Which means that now the exploit itself, okay, the malicious code itself will be loaded to particular browsers. So when it sees that, say for example, this is, uh, this is uh, Firefox browsers, so it will load uh, Firefox exploits. So if it's IE, so it will load IE exploits. So it won't simply launch the exploits. So you can decode uh, HTTP protocol as well. And to display it, you can use uh, dash T fields dash E to display particular HTTP properties like HTTP request or methods and so forth. Response codes, uh, user agents, content type, to search for what kind of files it is actually transferred. 
So the display filter is over in the Wireshark that uh, you can actually search for. FTP protocols. So F FTP connection methods, there is active, active mode, passive mode, extended passive modes. So what is active mode? FTP. I think most of you, use, uh, most of you use uh, FTP, right? Most of you use FTP. Yes, no. So, what is uh, active F, uh, active mode? FTP. Louder. So, for the passive FTP, the server will tell the client which part the client can connect to. Which means that if it's in active mode, so client is the, is the main, uh, main component. He will tell the server what kind of port he can connect to. So on passive, it's different. Passive is the server side will tell the client which port he can connect to. So in the, <coughs> in the active mode, FTP, Client initiate connection to FTP server port. The client's port is sent to the FTP server as well. Port greater than 1023. So FTP server will respond to the client. And FTP server will initiate a connection from port 20 to the client port. That's the reason why the firewall always block uh, active FTP. Because now if you have firewall here, so now your server is telling the server which port you can connect to. So now is from the server side, you need to go inbound. So most of firewall always block inbound traffic instead of outbound, correct? So that's why passive FTP, on the other hand, server will tell the client which port it can connect to. So client will initiate it. Will, it will connect to the particular port. So that's why it's, it's so fast. All right. Um, so extend, <laughs> all right, uh, passive FTP mode, uh, we have like uh, port. The difference between passive FTP mode and extended FTP mode is that uh, the calculations, OK, the calculations. Um, the extended passive FTP mode in the, in the packet itself, it will tell you exactly like what IP, what port, OK? But in the, in the uh, passive, FTP, not the extended one, basically you need to use the number, it has the high and low byte, so you need to use the high byte times, uh, times uh, 256, I can't really remember, but times 256 then plus, plus the low byte numbers, then that is the, num the port numbers of it. So here is the FTP commands, user, pass, delete, store, then start IMD, uh, retrieve, uh, abort, quit. So looking at this, these uh, particular commands, you know that uh, what, what uh, particular uh, FTP traffic is about. For example, if someone store file, means that someone is transferring files. So someone delete files, DLE. So they are retrieving file. So based on the command itself, so you know list, size, parts, many more. So it has the return code as well. So I have to go through very fast. So here, here are the return codes. You can refer in the websites, or maybe you can download our slides. So you can also process it, okay, process the, using the uh, Wireshark or T-Shark. And here's the SMTP protocol. So most of the slides uh, continuously are actually talking about the protocols and which particular field you should look at when it comes to network forensic. So that you don't blindly, okay, you don't do the blind analysis. Decoding SMB protocols, specific tools. So there are specific tools uh, for protocol analysis, like HTTP, you have a HTTP RY, HTTPS, you use SSL dumps, DNS cap for DNS traffic, TFTP grab for TFTP and so forth, and challenges in uh, protocol header analysis, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> Purpose of a traffic content analysis. You guys want to look at the demo or you guys want to read this? Demo? demo. All right. Yeah, you load the yeah. 
So I'm going to show you how many of you analyze packet data. You show the case. How many? How many of you actually analyze packet data using Wireshark? <coughs> so what we have uh, for the training case one. So what we actually have yesterday for our training was uh, we provided two cases. Uh, we are going to show you a free flow analysis, which means that it's free flow, whatever I want to do with the packet data, but based on the case, okay, based on the case. <coughs> so it's a very quick one. Yeah, the case involved um, uh, what you call is uh, insider, insider, uh, somebody leaking, uh, an insider leaking uh, company proprietary, uh, sensitive company information, and. Uh, the students were given uh, a packet trace to work with and try to answer a few questions. So these are some of the questions that was uh, asked, uh, basically identifying uh, the source, uh, identifying the uh, accomplice uh, who the insider talked to, and what file was uh, transferred from the, uh, from the company, and uh, what's the name of the file, and so on. So, So, um, based on the case, okay, based on the case, so you might see that uh, we are looking for the insider who are actually sending the file. So, <clears throat> you are given the packet data to analyze. So, the packet data itself is uh, case one. I desire the PCAP. Let's move it. I move it somewhere so that you guys can see it clearly. So I copy the file first to the case one directory. So I have uh, this file, which is uh, case one dash I desire to pick Everyone can see, right? So first of all, I'm going to verify it. If the file I copy, okay, if the file I copy is actually uh, has the same hash as the file I get from particular departments and so forth. So basically, if the hash is correct, based on the case BF9, FA, based on the case just now, you saw that they offer you the MD5, so you compare the hash, so the data is correct, copy correctly. So now, <clears throat> let's look at the size, like size of the packet uh, you're going to analyze. So it's 77 meg. Okay, it's 77 meg. So it's quite big, okay, 77 meg is quite big. So let's, let's see uh, 77 meg, how are we going to process it uh, quickly? So if you are using Wireshark, Say you're using Wireshark. Are you going to load this uh, on the Wireshark and analyze it packet by packet? Are you going to do that? So it will be very slow if you if you are doing that. So what we what we do is usually that uh, we are trying to check how many packets uh, we are going to analyze. So the cap info itself basically will tells you the information about this particular packet data. So now we know exactly that. The capture duration is about 1,000 seconds. So the start time of this particular event falls on 1, 1 o'clock and 29 minutes to 46 minutes. And then the data rate of it. So you roughly have the ideas that you're going to analyze for this particular time. And imagine 46, 29. So the duration of uh, this particular <coughs> PCAP is so short, it's so short, which means that in so short period, you have 77 meg file to analyze. Imagine you want to analyze gigabit of files. So if I'm going to proceed with analysis, so I'm not going to use Wireshark because I'm not going to look at the big packet one by one. 
So I'm going to have the idea basically what this packet uh, contains, what is the contents of these particular packets. So what I do is that I will try to run this PD state on this particular packet. So So from here you roughly have the ideas like for example uh, in this particular packet data what kind of traffic uh, actually dominate moose So say for example like HTTP it consumes a lot of traffic HTTP of course because HTTP belong to HTTP uh, HTTP belong to TCP so we see that 65 that it does, the traffic. So most of the traffic in the particular packet data are actually HTTP. So if you are the investigator, so you have to set the mindset that most of the data you are going to analyze is web protocols, okay, HTTP protocols. So now you are going, you are given the, you are given you are given a um, particular, what we call as uh, the case. Where is the case? So case one, I design the PCAT. So this case, it has what's the IP address of Chris machine, what's uh, Chris a non legitimate email address and so forth. So now I know most of the traffic I'm going to analyze is the HTTP traffic. So what I'm going to do next is that I'm trying to see what kind of ports are actually people are actually has inside the, this particular packet so that I know what kind of services I'm going to analyze as well. So in order to do that, so let's say you have a packet data. So let's see, uh, you read it. <coughs> So here is how, when you read the packet by packets itself. So you can see that there are so many packets. Okay, there are so many packets. So what we need to do now is trying to, to uh, decrease the time of analysis. So we are going to um, reconstruct it to session. Okay, reconstruct it to session. So what we can do is that we can convert the data, packet data to session data. So this command basically what it does is that it read the PCAT and then it write it to the flow data. So once you write it, <coughs> so let's look at the size. So the size is uh, 128k, okay, the size is 128k because uh, the flow itself, here's the flow, so flow, flow data basically gives you the, gives you the information which is session based, but flow itself is it's like multiple flows can be in particular sessions. So here, it's like you actually drill down the, you actually drill down the uh, analysis time. So you can see that particular IP connect to what, particular IP connect to what. So what if um, I construct it to sessions? So let me. Uh, So I construct it to sessions, and let's see how many lines, how many lines. So I use WC dash L to see how many lines. So it's two one five line. So it means there is about two hundred and fifteen sessions in this particular traffic. But now I'm interested in uh, what kind of uh, destination port. When we when we talk about port, we talk about network services that are used. If my presentation sucks, right, Amy, I'm going to blame you. So basically, um, yeah, if you want to know what kind of network services are used okay, by this particular guy, 
So we are going for the simple part. So what we can do is that what uh, what we can do is that we are trying to extract out the decision part. So let's do it. So this S is to show the particular field in particular field in the flow. So you can you can show the source address or the same address, right? So you can show particular parts. So you see so many parts. So what we can do is that um, we can actually um, sort it and then we try unique it. So now you actually have ideas like how what kind of decision part are actually connected to. So you have layer four endpoints. Layer four endpoints, which is part layer three endpoints, is your IP address. So you have the part like one three seven one three eight, what is six three. So you know like four four three HTTPS is using is using one one six three messengers, is using port eighty HTTP. So you really start to have idea what these guys is using. So now I also want to see the IP address are involved in this particular. So, so there are not so many IP that are in the source address and destination address. <coughs> so a lot of destination address. So <coughs> from here, let's say you see the source address. So here are the source address in particular packet data. So now you have a layer three endpoint, you have layer four endpoints, so you know what IP you are going to look at and what part you are going to, what kind of services you are going to look at. So since uh, since uh, HTTP dominates most of the traffic, and it has other traffic as well, so maybe we should look at other traffic. So if you want to look at other traffic, we can do things like I'm going to um, filter it. So I have this packet data. So I'm going to filter it to no HTTP. OK, I'm going to filter it to not HTTP. And then not port 80. This is BPF filters. OK, this is BPF filters. So that I don't want the port 80 traffic. I just want to look at others. So I have like other traffic. Let's look at other traffic size. Of course, in the time of analysis, you must write down, OK, you must have the case notes. So it's on, only 247k. So I prefer to just load this first. So I load it to Wireshark. Because it's very small size, it's even less than one meg. So it's easier for us to analyze. And all of them are non HTTP. So you can see there's a DNS. This is the DNS. And then most of the traffic are actually from 229.185. If you take out, if you take out, um, so if you take out uh, not DNS traffic, so apply. So basically, you don't want to see the DNS traffic as well. So now you can look at what kind of, this is UPnP. So go down. You can see like this MSN messengers traffic. So maybe we can see what kind of information. So we can see that here is a CM long. This is CM long at gmx.com. This is the email of, of the particular guy in the company. It's, he may be he's the suspected uh, insider. So 192.168.29.185. That's his IP address. So he's talking via. Messenger, okay, it's talking, yeah, MSN Messenger. So it's, <coughs> it's usually uh, easier for you, okay, to try to look at the outline, the macro view of particular packet data before you actually dig into it, okay, and look at packet by packet without having a crew, okay, without having a crew. Here is just a simple free flow analysis, okay, we are trying to show. So that uh, you can actually try to short, uh, trying to uh, reduce the time of analysis. 
Okay, I, I have the alarm, 16 minute overrun. Why Thank not, you very why much. Why not just Bingo. buffer overflow? 16 minute buffer overflow? Indeed, very much so. But as you can see, ladies and gentlemen, uh, they've, uh, they've got a lot of materials and they will be around throughout the whole conference these two days. Please feel free to approach them. And I'm sure they'll be more than happy to share um, uh, more details with you. Uh, and again, Mel, uh, C.S. Lee, thank you very much for your presentation today. All right. Thanks. Uh, everyone, we will now adjourn for lunch. If you look at the agenda, it does say we will resume at half past one in order to ensure that we maintain uh, on schedule and we don't end, end too late today, we will commence at 1.30. And hopefully, and, and I apologize for the short period of time, but you know who to blame, and <laughs> um, hope to see you back here at 1.30. Thank you very much.